Okay, well, welcome everybody. For those that don't know me, my name is Laura Sachs. And um, if you uh, haven't already, feel free to introduce yourself uh, in chat. And um, I'm with the West Kootenai Climate Hub. And I'm really excited to co-host this event today with uh, the East Kootenai Climate Hub. So I'm gonna turn that over to Sue for uh, her intro. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you today. I'm Sue uh, Karens with East Kootenai Climate Hub, and I'm joining from my home on Amakas Tanaka, the territory and homeland of the Tanaka people and nation. And I'm grateful for Tanaka's reciprocity with all living things and respect the importance of their teaching and practices and traditions. And I know the participants here today are also on the territories of the Shuklapam, the Silks, and the Sinaiks. Nice to see everybody today. Thank you, Sue. And um, um, one last reminder, if you haven't introduced yourself in chat, um, some weird feedback. Is anybody else getting that? I'm getting some reverb. Hey, Mary, can you mute while I'm talking? Can you mute, mute everybody? Or if, if everybody can just mute themselves just for now. Okay. okay. Yeah, that seems to have taken care of it. So whatever that was. So, okay. Well, um, anyhow, we're going to, I'm just really excited today to be able to have um, Mary Stockdale, uh, Stockdale uh, present and uh, this workshop for us. Uh, we're really fortunate to have her. Um, it's something that we've been talking about doing for a while. And so um, I'll be just as excited and learning as everybody here. And so I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Mary and let her introduce herself. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'll do a quick, a quick introduction, introduction to myself. Um, I'm an adjunct professor at UBC Okanagan campus, and I live in Vernon on Silk territory. And I've been concerned about climate change for quite a long while. Um, and in recent years, I've been working on two committees that are focused on engaging community members in, in the climate action plans. Um, both the plan of the UBC Okanagan campus and the plan of the city of Vernon. And both of, both of these climate action plans were launched in early 2021. So in both place, places, but mainly in Vernon, my community engagement efforts have mostly centered on recruiting, training and coordinating a group of uh, 35 plus climate ambassadors. And I've been giving them training based on a work that I did in the UK um, it was a group called Climate Outreach, and I'll talk more about that group later and what they do. So the training that I'm presenting to all of you today is modified from the training that I delivered to Vernon's Climate Ambassadors. So that's kind of where, where all of this comes from. So I'm going to do a share screen. Um, and I hope, is that all good? Yeah. Looks good. Good, good. And I'm just doing a bit of adjusting on my desktop here. <laughs> my... Uh, notes and things. Okay, so um, so by the end of this, so yeah, um, the workshop is going to be on effective messaging for climate action, extending the outreach. And um, this the purpose is to that by the end of this training, you'll have had the chance to work through some research based theory on climate communication. And then Spend some time with two exercises to develop your own approach to telling your story and connecting with your peers. So it's very much a sort of customized approach to how you can be a messenger amongst peers. So this is a generic training in that it's not for a specific application. Like we're not all working like in Vernon, we are all working at one stage around developing ideas and input for the climate action plan. But this is gonna be like for different reasons that people might wanna use this training. So you can incorporate what you learned today into formal presentations that you might wanna to make to your peers, but you could also incorporate what you learned today into informal one-on-one -on -one conversations. So really it's just some ideas that you can take in a variety of settings. So um, this is the agenda. And so as you can see from the agenda, we're gonna have two phases in this workshop. Um, so we're gonna have these, after these introductory portions, we're gonna have a 10 minute lecture from me on some climate communications principles, and then we'll break out into pairs for an exercise in telling your story, 
followed by a debrief as a large group and then a little break. And then after the break, we'll have another 10 minute lecture, another breakout in pairs for an exercise in connecting with your peers, followed by a debrief in the large group and a quick wrap up. Okay, so, um, so here's the first mini lecture. <laughs> So um, I, first, I'm going to introduce you to my friend, George Marshall. He's the man in the hat at the top. And he's an old friend of mine from my university days in the UK. And on the slide, you can see the cover of two books that he's written. So he founded an organization called Climate Outreach. And he's visited Canada several times um, from that, on behalf of that organization, giving workshops and climate communications. And the first time was to study how to craft messages about the carbon tax for Canadians and then do trainings in that. And then the second time he worked um, on climate communications in Alberta on how to talk to different groups of people in Alberta about the transition from fossil fuels. And he, that was when he was hired by the previous premier, Rachel Notley. So George came to visit uh, uh, my family for a rest at the end of um, one of those workshops. And I asked him if I could come and work for climate outreach on my year of leave on my sabbatical leave in the UK and so I had this job with climate outreach which is where I learned a lot of these um, this new knowledge that I've been applying in Vernon and at, at UBCO. So climate outreach is one of the world's leading climate communications organizations they've been doing this longer than just about anyone over 20 years and basically they research climate communication a lot of polls and surveys and interviews they translate this work into practical resources and workshops and I just want to show you there's diagrams depicting their theory of change or how climate outreach conceptualizes how they can have an impact in the world. So on the left is a diagram that shows that we're presently trapped in a vicious circle because if we have a weak mandate, like not a very wide mandate, where not enough of the public care to make climate action a priority, then you have weak climate policies, you, corporations are not incentivized to change and people continue with high carbon behaviors. So the theory of change of climate outreach is that you, we really need to focus on building a broad social mandate and not just the usual talking to the usual converted uh, environmentalists who see climate action as a priority. Um, because if we get that broader social mandate, then we get transformative climate policies, incentivize corporations and people starting to exhibit low carbon behaviors. So I mentioned that theory of change today because the idea of our workshop is that we're gonna think about how to extend our range to reach new audiences beyond the usual group of climate activists. Okay, so here's a really brief version of Climate Outreach's theory about good climate communications. And there's lots more, um, but I, we don't have a lot of time today. So I'm trying to keep it simple and just you know make a start basically. So um, let's start with the first part, which is the importance of trusted communicators. So people's views are formed by the people they know and trust. They're, they're formed by their peers. And that's why communicators really need to be matched with their audience. So for example, if you have a presentation to give to a group of, of young mothers, you wouldn't send in an old male businessman to talk to them, um, or at least you shouldn't, <laughs> and vice versa. So um, it really is about um, matching people with their peers. Um, and this study at Yale University is interesting. They asked people, who do you trust for information on climate change? And what they found was that as many people trusted their family and friends as trusted climate scientists. And there's a sign, this is a sign that for many people, experts are still trusted. I mean, it's good news, right? Um, and actually there's a, I went to a webinar recently um, by about where Canadians are at on climate change. And it's a, there's a 2023 study that shows Canadians still, a lot of them still put a lot of trust in um, experts. Like they have high, they ranked highly scientists, health professionals and university academics for people they trust for information, as long as the, those people stayed within their areas of expertise. But what's relevant here is that for as many people, trust is placed in the people closest to them, their family and friends. So this is another powerful source of messaging in addition to the experts. So partly the reason 
friends and family are so important is because people aren't super like emotionally motivated by facts and figures. And, and this, this, this slide says the only people motivated by facts and figures are the people who understand them. So that's a bit of a problem. Sometimes people don't quite get what, what, what that scientist is talking about. However, something that really does motivate people is the sense of shared identity and values and the joy of belonging to a group. We're social animals. So I'll talk a bit more about that idea of shared identity and values later. Um, but for now, I, I wanna think about what makes someone feel trustworthy. So um, I'd like to have a, a bit of feedback here. If you could think back to an individual you met personally at some stage in your life that had a big influence on you, um, could you tell me what were they like? How did they speak to you? What made them inspiring? What are the qualities that made them inspiring and trusted? Could anyone, uh, just a couple people could throw out a couple comments, that would be great. Uh, I'm a bit uh, like spectrum -y. So for me, it's always been people who um, like really take the time to like align their arguments, right? Like I really like people who are really precise with what they're saying. Um, but I think that like, that's probably not going to be most people's answers because I don't think that's what most people, like, like most people it's more, I think, from the outside looking at the rest of you i think a lot of it's more feeling mm -hmm. based but for me it was very lightly like the particulars of the ideas mattered very deeply and fair enough i mean that and that you know facts should matter and people being able to present them clearly and well so so that's good for for me it was uh their personal stories and uh their non-judgmental uh being non-judgmental towards me that's nice yeah yeah, not not feeling like you're being judged. Yeah, I would say uh, humble and empathetic. Yeah. Uh, good listeners. If they're a good listener then and have a good two way conversation. I can trust that. Yeah, that's it. That's great. Yeah. Anything else? I think um, one of the qualities for me is authentic. Like mm -hmm. they speak from their heart and 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 they're speaking to a part of me that that understands that or can can um <laughs> for the lack of a better word vibe with it yeah 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 resonate okay thank you I, I won't continue too much longer just because of the time issue but that's been very helpful and and I do have this slide where some ideas have been put together from previous uh workshops but you've you've identified a lot of them that um people who are sincere people who seem committed and consistent, you know, not hypocritical, but like consistent with what they're talking about in their actions. People who are well-informed, who display good judgment, uh, don't have vested interest um, and are brave. Um, th all of those things inspire people. Does that make sense to you? A lot of those qualities. So one of the things that comes out of that is, is it important as a communicator to actually like live the talk so to, to lead by example, because sometimes our actions are more powerful than our words. Uh, people look to what we're doing. And so these qualities are what we look for in our Vernon Climate Ambassadors. And uh, I remember in one of our trainings is we had these two little girls who came to our training and because they had been inspired by Greta Thunberg, they were like 10 to 11 years old. And during the Greta Thunberg time, you know, they, they, they got, they formed a little group called Fridays for Future and they started on their spring break. They came every day to our city hall in Vernon with signs and, you know, they just kind of talked to everyone who came in and out saying, please do more staff at city hall, please do more for on climate action for us, for our future. So um, in our training, we all agreed that Sadie and Molly were like great examples of trusted communicators. The, you know, because just looking at them, you're like, that's pretty brave. So, and they're, you know, obviously sincere. So um, the other thing besides these qualities is that we look for people from a diverse range of backgrounds um, who can speak to our different community groups and reach beyond the usual climate activists for that broad social mandate that climate outreach was talking about. But, you know, it's not easy to do that. So you, these are kind of special people. And if they're willing to step forward and be leaders in their own social groups, 
what we've discovered is they need a lot of support, you know, and they need a lot of backup and support to in trying to do that. Um, so um, now we're going to, we're coming to our first exercise, um, which is in telling your story. And this is um, a little bit what the story could look like what's on the slide. But I guess before we launch into it, I just want to ask why you think, why would you think that having a story to tell or thinking about your story is important? You, you may have already been sort of exposed to this in other talks and other lectures, uh, other sort of trainings, but um, any ideas on why why pe why we need to think about our own story or our personal narrative? Because other people might be able to relate to it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's part of that leading by example and being relatable and connecting to people. Yeah. I think it's also just that like subtext carries a lot of weight because of mm -hmm. how like brains work. You know, we're we're information absorbing machines, and I think that like your story is context and context can help make sure the ideas convey their depth correctly like otherwise like they can be overly shallow that's brilliant <laughs> yeah i think i think so i think also stories are little packages that humans are used to using you know for remembering things and passing things on it's just sort of a way you know that we we communicate yeah well sort of help. go ahead yeah no i mean like, literally like like i've seen some arguments that we're storytelling apes like the, the thing that we're really doing is storifying because how else would we orient ourselves in time like it's literally like a necessity of what we are as beings and so yeah. stories absolutely define everything we're doing in yeah. fact i think really on like a more macro meta sense like what we're doing right now is trying to figure out how to tell a story that unravels the current predominant story that everything's fine and on course for something that's going to work <laughs> and we yeah. somehow have to unravel that other story and retell it in the package that people you know are willing to listen to and hear yeah uh, it, it's sort of um i think um if you can tell a story that shows so if you can tell a story that says um i'm like you i'm your peer uh, but i'm really worried and concerned about climate change and I'm really doing what I can about it. It's 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 it sort of reaches people in a different way than seeing something in the news, and you know. So it's sort of that connection, um, because people are inspired by the stories of other people, especially if they're people they trust and respect and who they can relate to. But the the key here is that the stories have to be authentically yours, and they have to come from the heart. So you've got to kind of dig there deep there and find your story. So I'm I'm going to tell you about a friend who and his story. Normally I tell this in the Okanagan and I feel like oh they don't know this guy but you guys some of you might know him because <laughs> he's from Caslo. Um so one of the friends of George Marshall and mine um uh, is John Cathro who um we, we met in England. We all kind of went to school together in England. So when, John, when George Marshall was visiting John Cathro came over to Vernon to see him and said I'm doing a fire smart program, you know, where I'm talking to people um, about how to prepare for wildfires, but I really need to know, you know, how to, how to communicate this well, George. So George said, and he worked together on a story. And, and the one that John came up with was that he and um, Kari, his wife, had built their home by hand, you know, uh, which I'd say is a pretty kootenay thing to do. Um, so he, they, they built this lovely home. Um, sort of on the edge of the forest and it's where they've raised their kids um and so he told that story and then and then he said you know and I'll be damned if all that wildfires burn it down so he he could have come like he's a you know registered professional forester he's hired by government he could have come and said I'm an expert and here's what you should do but what he was trying to do I think is just make a connection to why this training this this thing he was about to say mattered to him and why it might you know might matter to all of us in the group so I, I i like that story and i hope john forgives me for <laughs> telling it to people in his own community um so on to the exercise so in this exercise i want you to think about how you might construct your story based on the the cues in the previous slide um so all of you were asked to come to a workshop with a peer group in mind so this would be a group that you belong to that you might want to talk to about climate change 
Um, and so for this workshop today, let's stretch it a bit and try not to make this a group of climate activists, but one of the other groups in your community that you belong to. So it could be based on work or family or a faith group or a hobby or a sport. Um, so try to keep that group in mind as your audience when developing your story. And so you're each going to be put into pairs in a breakout group for 10 minutes. You take two minutes to introduce yourself and look at the instructions and think quietly about your own responses. And the instructions, by the way, are on this slide and the previous slide. So you can access them by clicking on the link that Laura has put in the chat. But these e same slides were sent to you by email, I think an hour ago as well. So Laura's gonna send out a reminder at two minutes for the person one to start talking. And at this time, I'd like one of you to take four minutes to talk about your ideas for your story. And the role of the other person is mainly to listen attentively and supportively. And um, it's fine for you to offer feedback if you're asked to, but otherwise try not to, just try to listen. Um, and to ensure a fair division of time, Laura will then send another reminder after four minutes for person two to start talking. And then after that, those four minutes will bring you back with a one minute warning, okay? So one last thing is that if for some reason your pair is not working, like for example, if the other person doesn't turn on their video or engage or something like that, you are able to come back in the main room and we can find you in another room and partner. Okay, so let's go for our groups. Okay. Okay, well, welcome back. Uh, before you start, I just want you to know I'll be leaving at about around 11.10. Okay. Oh, I think we're ending at 11. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. And Mary, I'm seeing like a whiteboard, unless oh. that's a blank screen. Oh, no, it should be a slide. Okay, then I must be doing something very weird here. I wonder if I pressed the wrong thing. Maybe just reshare. Yeah, I'm going to go back to stop share and try again. Sorry about that, everyone. Share screen. And maybe I just clicked on the wrong thing. Um, okay, how does this work for you? Just let me get, I'm really struggling with all the different displays. There, how's that? Is that the actual? Yeah, Perfect. The slide, right? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, so welcome back everyone. I, I've got my second 10 minute lecture to give. So I'm just going to go on to the, the other two principles. So the second principle of climate communications is having a positive vision. And um, what the research says is that communications based on disasters, negativity and distant impacts have little impact on attitudes. People must just kind of sh wanna shut that out. And so this Time Magazine um, article uh, front cover is kind of doing it all wrong. Um, right, they're, they're, they're really kind of scaremongering and they're also showing a polar bear that's kind of um, a distant impact, right? It's not showing how people's own lives will be affected. It's just talking about polar bears. So um, this is kind of what often the media does is the storyline is, is not about a positive visioning at all. They, they tend to say something like a terrifying future is coming. Whatever we do, it will be a disaster anyway you must immediately give things up to prevent it being even worse. And even then it may be too late. So, you know, that kind of messaging is so scary and so disempowering. I, I think it just makes people freeze, you know? So um, instead what they say, the kind of version we should be promoting is that big changes are already happening, that we are resilient, um, creative and proud of who we are. We can work together to prepare and protect ourselves. And when we do, we can make the future better than it would otherwise be. So, you know, these messages of um, acceptance, you know, changes are happening and we are going to have some loss and, and grief, um, but identity around who we are, we and our peers, um, this idea that we can cooperate and that it will be better if we do that. Bringing in, you know, ideas around co-benefits too. You know, what 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 might be better about life if we actually tackle climate change. Um, so keep those concepts in mind when you're crafting a message to your peers because they are motivating and and empowering messages. 
Okay, a third point is this idea of building your messaging around a sense of shared identity and values. So um, strong communicators say, if you're talking to your peers, this is who we are. This is what we care about. When we do this climate action, we belong even more to our group. We're even more who we're supposed to be. And the world becomes more how we want it to be. So that's the positive visioning part. So just as an example, um, here in Vernon, um, we have three Rotary Clubs. <laughs> and so one of the things we realized is the Rotarians are a pretty powerful group to talk to, to, to engage with in climate discussion and climate action. Because, uh, you know, small businessmen, they have money, they, they have a lot of agency, they get stuff done. So one of our uh, ambassadors, he, he, who was a Rotarian, what he dis developed as messaging was, you know what, we in the Rotary Club, we, we know how to get stuff done. You know, we even managed to get rid of smallpox, you know, all around the world, we just all work together and we actually eradicated smallpox. So if we can eradicate smallpox, we Rotarians can do something pretty serious about climate change. You know, we're the kind of people who can get stuff done. So, so that's, that's um, that kind of messaging, um, you know, about, about the Rotary Club that, that is really effective. So um, there's also this idea around in-groups and out-groups. So we define ourselves by who we are, our in-group, and who we are not. And this can work in our favor. It can also work against us sometimes. So um, here is something that never ceases to amaze me because I am an environmentalist, but is that many people distrust environmentalists. Um, you know, I can't believe it. Like, how can this be? <laughs> We're nice people. But actually, when many people think of environmentalists, they think of things like save this or stop that or defend this or polar bears or the environment or no you can't do that you know so for many people environmentalists sort of come with this kind of a negative um kind of impression so um for depending on your group you can actually use this in your favor you know kind of distance yourself from environmentalists but still bring them on board and so a, a story I like from George Marshall, when he was working in Alberta, he actually um, had an, a sort of ambassador who worked, had worked all his life at Suncor. So the Suncor guy went and talked to a group of retired um, people who'd worked in oil and gas industry. And what he said was, you know, he started it out by his speech out by kind of taking a swipe at David Suzuki. He said, I don't like David Suzuki. You know, um, I spent my whole life, you know, not liking the guy criticizing what he says. Um, however, I'm scared shitless about climate change. And this is why, and this is what I'm doing about it. So, so he kind of established that connection, you know, like we're not environmentalists, I'm not an environmentalist, but I am, I've, 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 I've realized climate change is a really serious issue and I'm doing what I can about it. Okay, so there's, <laughs> I don't know if that works for you or not, but it's just a thing. <laughs> that's out there about you know identifying with your group another huge thing around in groups and out groups is how we're divided by our politics so um uh this slide is showing that it's really unfortunate that climate change has become politicized as in party political because it didn't used to be um but it is now so this slide the blue is saying that's people who agree the proportion of people that agree with the statement, everything about climate change that's been said about climate change is exaggerated. And the green are people who agree with climate change is a global emergency that has to be tackled immediately. So you can see, wow, what a stark difference. Um, and so it's, you can see that, you know, most people in the NDP, green, liberal and bloc Quebecois don't have to be convinced as much as those in the conservative and people's party that climate change is an issue we really have to tackle. Um, and George Marshall, he advises us to aim center right in our messaging. So to aim to the center right, the far right, perhaps give up on that. <laughs> but the center right is, a, is a, a movable middle, a group of people that can be won over and are very important to win over if we want to broaden our social mandate. And, and for us in the Okanagan, which where we vote conservative pretty predictably, this really makes a lot of sense to have a messaging that's aiming center right. So... Um, basically, um, 
we, we spend a lot of time thinking, how do we reach conservative audiences? So here's a word cloud that was a product of a question that asked conservatives for one word that described their core values. And here's the, here's the, here are the words that they had as values that are important to them. I don't know if this rings true to you in, in terms of conservative core values, but things like integrity, honesty, common sense, um, practical, um, community people, protectors, you know, that, that, those kinds of words, family people. Um, so um, if you were going to do a, ask a question of your audience, your peer group, it's a good exercise is to think, what, what words do you think would pop up in a word cloud for your group? You know, what core values do you think they rally around? And try to work with those and, and with their sense of common identity. Um, just as a fun example, you know, there, I like this example of the population of Texas, obviously a conservative group. And so if you were someone who was a communicator and you were trying to stop them from littering, what would you do? How would you describe their identity? What are their core values? And how would you work with these? And I don't know how many of you have been to Texas, but here's what they came up with. Don't mess with Texas. So um, this, this was brilliant, right? It's sort of, it's sort of all about how Texans feel about themselves. Um, and apparently it's been a very effective anti-littering campaign that's been running for 20 years. So um, each of you probably, you know, amongst our whole group, we probably have a number of very different audiences that we're thinking of. And perhaps each one would require different messaging on climate change based on their very different identities and core values. And here's a list of messages about why we need to take action on climate change. But you can see, I think, for your group, some of these will work better and some of these will work less well, right? So some people really care about polar bears, and, 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 but many people don't. There's a number of people who don't actually care about children and their responsibility to children. Um, and there's others who aren't particularly worried about what's happening to people in Bangladesh. But maybe they're more inspired by, you know, there could be jobs in, in this new green economy, or they're, maybe they're inspired by more what's happening in their own local community and what could happen in their own local community. So you just need to figure out what messaging works um, and that there's different strokes for different folks. You know, what resonates with you may not resonate in another group of people for another group of people. So, so um, we're now time for exercise two. So we, I've got that slide again about what strong communicators say. Um, so I want you to think about a message that's about the group's sense of identity, about the core values, it's try to say something that creates a sense of we, of belonging in a group, of working together, and about how the world becomes more how we want it to be if we take action. So include that positive vision, some of the co-benefits of taking action on climate change. And um, in this exercise, uh, again, um, basically what you're going to do is construct some messaging based on that earlier slide for connecting to your peers, crafting it around um, maybe a specific climate solution in your community that you're wanting to talk about anyway. So maybe organic bins and composting or, or maybe it's like, um, let's, you know, we need to use transit more, I don't know, or bicycles or whatever, or just use a, a very generic message that a recent webinar told us we, we really need to be um, promoting as the essential climate solution. So a message around, we really need to, need to electrify everything using clean energy and get off fossil fuels. You can think about that. Um, but if you want to just be more specific, that's also good. But think, go into pairs. This time you're going to get 15 minutes. Take one minute just to kind of get yourself thinking about your messaging. And then I think we'll just try to have seven minutes per person to think about how you would be messaging with your this particular chosen peer group in mind. Okay, so Laura, are you ready to send us off into our groups? Yes, I am. So I'm um, opening all the rooms right now and um, have great. a great discussion, everyone.